This episode was the bomb. It was brilliant. It was good. It, the ending of it. The ending. Oh my god, it just comes around full circle. It feels like the end of a season, but it's it's not. It's like the end of uh, the first half of the season. Well, there's only two more episodes being released after this year. But it really does feel like it, it's setting up the finale. It really is. But it felt like the ending, the conclusion. It went around full circle and tied into season one brilliantly. <laughs> Looking back, I was on to something when I made the review in episode one about the gate, and I didn't think I didn't look into it. You know, I didn't think about that there. You know, if I had a sat and thought the gate, <laughs> fuck. You know. All right, I'll make a start here. Read my new skip myself right. So episode seven. Uh, Robin, Nancy, Steve, and Eddie are exploring the upside down. Yes, they managed to get kill all the not kill all the bats, but get rid of them and fight them off. And Robin brings up the possibility that Steve could get rabies, and he's like, I don't fucking know, <laughs> maybe. Um, and then they just move on. They run to the the, the woods there to hide from the demo bats, and they, they manage to lose them. And um, I think it's Eddie is I was on like a log. And he's walking over, and is it Nancy tells him, you know, um, be careful where you step because you touch the, even the vines that um. Demogorgons, Demobats and Vecna will all see you at once and they'll come straight here, which is interesting. Uh, they, Nancy convinced them that if they go to her house, um, she has weapons there. I don't remember. The, was in earlier seasons, did Nancy get guns? Did she get a gun in season one or season two? I cannot remember. And I rewatched the freaking show before season four. Maybe she did. You know, she had them under her bed. I can't remember, did she? But her plan is, get the guns, find Vecna, and just shoot him, bang, dead. That's her plan. And they make it to her house. And when she goes around in her room, she realises that um, everything she sees in her room is not what's currently in her room in the present. She realises that in the upside down, the way that this dimension works, they're in the past. They are in her room when it was season one. So that um, the upside down doesn't seem to friggin' catch up with uh, the present as quick. And it looks like um, friggin' that, that would explain why later on whenever she finds Barb's body, it literally looks just exactly as it did season one. Like by now it should be a skeleton, it shouldn't even hardly be there, but it is. Yeah. So time must move slower in the upside down. Yeah, I thought, you know, looking by the teaser trailer, a lot of fans, and all, myself included, suspected that season 4 would include some form of time travel. You know, it was hinted, but they didn't really fully go into it. Maybe they'll explore that in the final two episodes or so. Mm. I think it's going to get crazy. I hope it does. I love a good mind bender of a series in the film. Steve's able to hear Dustin's voice and realises that uh, in the real world, in our reality, that Dustin is at Mike Wheeler's house, Nancy's house as well. And basically is like, you know, how do we send a message? Because they start shouting and screaming and Dustin can't hear them, but they can hear Dustin. And they remember that Joyce used lights in season one to communicate with her son Will when he's in the upside down. She had like the Christmas tree lights all up in the wall and wrote the alphabet and paint and told Will to touch each light, you know, to spell out the words if it help him communicate, you know, what he wanted to say, and he, she'd be able to speak to him, ask questions, he'd be able to answer them, and vice versa. Um, so, you notice all these like, wee particles, like, wee sparkles, it's kind of like glitter around uh, the chandelier lights, and they put their hands through it, and they get like a buzz off of like a nice feeling, and it allows them to, uh, they, they know how to do SOS, and they're able to use SOS messages through the lights, and uh, inform Dustin, of where they are and what their plan is, why it's in the real world. So he re he doesn't realizes that they're in their location, but in the upside down, and they can hear everything that's going on. And they're able to use uh, kind of like Morse code or so. I don't really know how Morse code Morse code works. We're able to use that there to communicate. So they realize that without the guns, they can't they can't fight Vecna. They don't stand a chance. So they arrange to meet with uh, Dustin. I like us, and uh, I forget her name, it's not Susie, it's Dustin, it's Luke's wee sister, the annoying one. 
Uh, no offense to the actor. Uh, where basically what they do is they go to, I think they go to um, Eddie's caravan and Dustin has an idea where he has a long piece of rope and he, the gate of the upside down is in his caravan, Eddie's caravan and he throws the rope up in, through the gate and it's like being held like that there where he can yank on it, it won't fall down uh, Nancy, Rob and Steve can yank on it and it won't fall down in the upside down. So they basically climb up uh, from the upside down into friggin' the real world. And uh, Nancy's about to go next. Eddie went first. Nancy's about to go next. All of a sudden, she, as she's climbing up, she falls, like falls into this abyss. And then she like wakes up in this swimming pool. And I knew right away it was the same swimming pool from season one. I knew right away when I saw that. And like, because I recognised it. And I was waiting to see Barbara's body. And then Vecna torments Nancy and basically is like, Hey, you know, uh, do you remember what you did? You left your friend Barb to die. And whenever she cut herself and bled into the pool, and then Gordon pulled her in the upside down and attacked her and killed her. Well, that's come back. And then Vecna's like, you know, oh, you've been doing a lot of research on me. I'm going to show you, you know, who I am, what my past is about. And it shows the Victor, it shows the Creel House where um, you get to see the same scenes you've seen earlier, but from a new perspective, where it shows uh, Victor Creel's son, Henry, walking around the house that he had powers and all this stuff. And that he was more sensitive than Victor Crew thought. Victor Crew thought that, you know, he was just, he was able to pick up on things, vibrations and energies. But no, he was able to do a lot more than that there, and I'll get to that in a second. Vecna targets people who are traumatized, and who, who we'd all forgotten that Nancy was traumatized by, you know, Barb's disappearance and death. <laughs> I should have saw that coming, didn't I? But, you know, we kind of thought, because she hasn't mentioned it much, you know, or talked about it. You know, you'd think that she's probably healed and moved on. Like, Barb got her justice at the end of season two. But, of course, you know, PTSD, post-match stress disorder, it's not something that, you know, for a lot of people would ever really go away. Like, I think when it's there, you have that for life. It's never going to go away. As Hopper would say, every day gets a little easier, but it's never really gone. I don't think. Regardless of how much medical help, look, I don't know, don't quote me, not there, I don't know if there's a like a proper cure for PTSD, I haven't really looked into that much. So Hopper insults and fights Enzo, uh, intentionally pisses him off, mocks his family and his son. The Russian guard intervene and the Russian guards intervene and wreck it up. And they're thrown into a cell. Enzo has a gold hopper about, you know, what the hell are you playing at? And then Hopper turns around and says, Yeah, there's one thing that uh, the demagogues don't like and that don't like and that's fire. And he reveals that that was really just uh, to grab the lighter off one of the guards that they can use to fight off the demagogues. So when I saw that scene I, I knew that you know, there's a reason Hopper's doing this is it's you know, but you also look at it and be like, Oh, he's probably saying this here because, you know, he's he's fucked off everybody and everyone just wants to have a go. And he's frustrated, but no, he had a plan there, a last, ditch, a last ditch effort, and it worked. So Joyce and Murray make it to the Russian base. Murray has successfully convinced all the Russian guards that he is Yuri, and none of them are questioning it. One of the um, high ranking officers does say to Murray, You know, uh, the Yuri that I was told about had one screw loose, and makes you think that, you know, oh, this guy's clocked on that. that you know, Murray isn't Yuri, and uh, Murray's like, oh shit, what do I do now? And the guards are like, uh, you know, but you have a lot of screws loose, you know, and he's like, yeah. So it kind of, you know, hinted that the, the high ranking officer suspected that Murray wasn't Yuri, but uh, no, he'd be fully bought on it completely. Murray hasn't been completely convinced. So uh, back with Eleven, Dr. Martin Brennan decides to, to skip the timing of Eleven's memories closer to when all the kids were killed. The Hawkins staff member has befriended Eleven and is helping her to escape at this point. Uh, so he basically shows her this like hole, I think this drain pipe that probably is in the sewer or something. It's probably the same one that she does escape through. I don't know. And he's she's like, you know, why don't you come with me? And he's like, you can't because he has like a tracker inside his neck. 
and that Martin Brenner will always know where he is and be able to catch him again. And Eleven, using her powers, um, <coughs> rips it out of his neck. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's in real life, if that's not happened to you, you wouldn't be standing after that, but you probably sever a vein or something. Like, that's pretty close to your jugular. I think your jugular is here, isn't it? Or is it here? I don't know. And um, blah, blah, blah. And I was thinking to myself, you know, why doesn't this guy just... Use, why doesn't he use his own powers to rip about himself? But he did it to gain Eleven's trust. I think he was more just manipulating her. But I, I knew right there and then, you know, there was more. I knew he was number one, and he was with Eleven. I knew. So um, whenever the guards arrive, they basically like have clocked on as to what they're doing. He's helping her escape, and they basically run away. And the other guards find them, and it didn't surprise me at all this year. That um one uh, for the first time uses his powers to disarm the guards, and um, this shocks Eleven because she didn't realize that he was one. Hopper, Enzo, and the rest of Sandmates are in the pit, and the Demogorgon is is about to be released. Joyce and Murray are standing above the pit, watching, looking down. They can see Hopper; uh, they're just a few meters away, but he has no idea that they're there. Um, he's literally just sitting there, you know, preparing himself for death, to fight to the, for the death, you know, with this Demogorgon. And he knows the guys that he's with, even though they're five grown men, and they probably have some experience in fighting, none of them would be prepared to fight the Demogorgon. And a lot of them are pretty terrified too, I'd say. As they release the Demogorgon, um, Murray decides to reveal that he's not really Yuri, and holds the high-ranking officer at gunpoint, and is like, you know, either you, you know, stop this fight now, or we'll kill you. And he drags him in, into the control room and tries to force him to get the Demogorgon out to save Hopper. The thing is, um, the guards are completely unwilling to do that because they realise that if they do that, if they let that Demogorgon out, it will kill every single person in that prison, including the guards, Joyce, Murray, and they're not going to risk uh, their lives whenever they're in their hands. And they're, 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 they're adamant that they're, they're sticking by it. So um, what they do, they manage to, I think Joyce presses the button anyway because um, Murray, uh, I think doesn't have his glasses and he's only able to see properly. And uh, at this point it jumps back to uh, the pit where Hopper and Enzo are fighting off. The rest of the song is getting slaughtered, murdered. Um, and Hopper and Enzo are backed up against the door and Hopper has managed to get the um, this stick lit on fire and he's using it to, to scare off the Demogorgon and he's able to do it in time whenever Joyce hits the button, the doors open, he goes in and then the doors are closing, the Demogorgon is still coming, he's still doing that and the Demogorgon gets like stuck in the doors and is trying to get in and he like, you know, just whenever the fire goes out he just throws the stick right into the Demogorgon's mouth and that gets the back away and the door is shut. They were in the other room the cell room, the Demogorgon was inside, they're safe from there. And then another set of doors in that room put up. Hopper and Enzo walk into the next room and Hopper's the look on Hopper's ex face is just like, <coughs> holy shit, is this real? Am I really seeing this? Because uh, there is Joyce and Murray standing right there in front of him, right before his eyes. He cannot believe that they made it to the prison and they're there to rescue him. And as I just said earlier, you know, yeah, she saves your life because of friendship. No, because I think she has feelings for Hop. And then uh, friggin' Hopper and Joyce uh, embrace, they hug. She goes over him with tears in her eyes and uh, he slowly cracks a smile. And that's probably the first he's actually smiled in a year since before he was captured. And I, I imagine that's probably how the Rick Grimes, Michelle and Daryl Dixon reunion will play out on The Walking Dead. You know, the Rick Grimes movies, they'll probably play out something like that there, where they're like, you know, they have that look at each other, it's like, oh my god, you know, there he is, he's alive. And Rick's looking at them going, is this real, or he's really here? You know, I, I'd say it, it'd be something like that there. It was a real nice one, but that was probably one of the, one of the best, most heartwarming scenes of the season was to see that reunion and they saved the for episode 7 the bastards that's what happens here but you know what now we're going to be thinking what's going to happen next you know for the next uh, the final two episodes of season 4 you know how is their chemistry the dynamic going to play out you know they've got a lot to talk about same as Rick Michonne and Daryl will have a lot to talk about how is Rick going to react with yours about the Whisperer arc and the Commonwealth <laughs> right last paragraph
Now that one's lovely friend is revealed to be one. After one had killed the guards, he basically shoved Eleven into our room and told her to wait there. And then I think you hear all the screams again and all the, the murders going on. And I knew right there and then, okay, one's the evil one. He's the one that killed all the kids, but why? What was his reason? What was his purpose? Eleven goes to find him, and there you go. Sure, she finds the room that um, Dr. Martin Brenner was in in the first episode. That he was knocked out, and there's a dead kid beside him, the one that he was talking to. And then she goes to that the rainbow room, and there's one. And he's killing the the same kid that was bullying Eleven. I mean. As I said, you know, I was fine with him being electrocuted because he was an asshole to Eleven, but I don't think he deserved to die. I don't think, you know, that, that was wrong. Um, and it shows you how much of a heart that Eleven has that she, you know, she felt sympathy for the guy that threatened to kill her and bully her and all that there. She even felt sympathy for him whenever Papa was electrocuting him. You know, and then one just turns around and he's like, yeah, I'm like an evil bastard, I'm the big villain here and I want you to join me kind of thing. And uh, Eleven's like mortified, horrified, like, what, who are you, you are a monster, and yes he is a monster in disguise, you know. So they have this battle where they use their powers to fight one another, and it looks like one has the upper hand on Eleven, where he like, you know, raises her up and he almost breaks her arms and legs, I think he, he, he does in the first memory, you know, where she failed, but the, the, I, think, I think it reloops again. And this time she um, has flashbacks of all the memories, like of her mum and all, what made her sad, what made her happy, like, you know, her mum being lobotomized and all that crap. <sighs> so, um, she fights back and she slams one th like, through the mirror into the other room against the wall. And it looks like she's tearing him open, tearing him apart and obliterating him. But really what she just did was open the gate to the upside down for the first time by the looks of it. And uh, he goes flying through it, one does, uh, into the upside down. And he's struck by lightning and all, and he's breathing in all the toxicness of the upside down. And it's, he gets all deformed, his skin is burned. And then he starts to look like somebody familiar. He, his skin is all burned and all that there. And I knew right there and then what they were doing. I knew who he was. And it, not only was he Henry Creel, Victor's son, you know, he had, you know, he was a, a doctor, Papa, come to take him away and look after him. He's Vecna. The last shot shows uh, Vecna, you know, with all the tentacles meditating or whatever. And he turns his arm over and has the tattoo of one on his left wrist. Clever. But it was such a cool moment, you know, they played Eleven's theme, her epic theme, whenever she's like, you know, walking up to one and she basically just, with all her strength, you know, tries to kill one because she realises this guy's a monster and he's gonna, you know, you know, cause great harm and terror to humanity and she just takes him out. But instead what she did was not only open the gate, is that she turned him into the monster that he is and she didn't kill him. You know, so we, now he's a bigger threat, and this is what uh, Martin Brenner wanted Eleven to go through to help her remember, you know, what she'd done. I don't know if this is the showrunner's retcon on um, Stranger Things 4 or not, I don't know, or if this was the plan from the, the beginning, I have no idea. But um, I, I love it, the way that this all played out, and then they, they ended it right there. Another thing that I didn't <laughs> I'd like for them to address, you know, how can you speak to the man that who lobotomized your mother? In season one or two, it's revealed that Martin Brenner lobotomized uh, Eleven's mum, had like a, like these like headphones or something around her, and sent electric electricity through her brain and just fried it. And now she's in like a, you know, she's a vegetable mentally state. She's in a vegetable state mentally, and Eleven has to work with him, talk to him. But I suppose it's more, you know, there's a bigger. There's bigger stakes here than what's happened between her and Martin Brenner. You know, many lives are in, possibly even the world are in danger because of Vecna. And Martin Brenner's the only one who knew how to reach out to Eleven and help her regain her powers. He did train her, you know, to do that there in season one. So uh, that'd bring him back. But now they're trying to make Eleven stronger to take Vecna down. I enjoyed season four. I think I, I enjoyed season four a lot more than season three. Season three had some fun moments in it. And it was, I think it was funnier. 
but season four was a lot darker. It was darker, and I'm glad none of the rest of the episodes were just like episode one. I'm glad you know that it, it pulled itself together. Please do not do that again. The, the dumb with episode one, like just milk everything through eighty stereotypes as if you don't know what you're doing. Please don't do that. That was awful. But yeah, I think season four episode one is probably the worst episode out of all the seasons. But after that, there it picked itself up and got better, and they killed it this time. I think that season four they pretty much outdone themselves. I go as far as to say that season four is probably just as good as season one, if not better. Brilliant. You know, touche. Now I will just have to wait for the next two episodes. They're, they're, apparently they're meant to be really long, but uh, now we're being told that they're not as long as they were said to be. I don't know whether they were cut down or not, or maybe they were always just short, but somebody just exaggerated the length of them. Wait, they're meant to be two feature length movies. <laughs> they will probably just be an hour each or so, or an hour and a half each. Or maybe 45 minutes, who knows. But uh, I'm looking forward to that. And they won't be released until, uh, I think, it's, is it the 1st of July? It's sometime in July. They'll be streaming on Netflix again. Them two episodes. And then we'll have season 5 to look forward to. And they also have plans for a Stranger Things spin off that could be about 11, different location, different people, doing their own thing. Who knows? They won't talk about the spin off. Obviously, because it'll spoil what's currently happening on the show, but they have you know an idea of who it'll be about and where it'll be, and they haven't pushed it to Netflix yet. I think they're going to wait until season five ends. Right now, they're focusing on season five, I'd say, and just make sure the Stranger Things gets the finish, the the real finish it gets. And I prefer that they did that there because it means that this show's not going to melt, melt. You know, season four episode one was kind of melt. But it's a show that's going to run its course and not be dragged out and milked to the point where it's like uh, The Walking Dead, where it's repeating the same storyline over and over again with different characters and different outcomes. And when it's just the same shit. Yeah, that's what I like about Stranger Things. It never did that. So yeah, I enjoyed this season. Um, I think that's all I have to say. Now I can take a break from uploading videos every single day. I was just trying to stay on top of things, you know. No, I'll just be talking about the Kenobi videos. Bye-bye.